journalism doesn't have the right to be between the people and politicians. That's not our right. We can't sit on an ivory tower and assume that right. But journalism has a duty to try to communicate to as many people as possible what is happening in the world with added context. And if you lose that, society loses. That was the voice of David Lynch, a 30-year veteran of journalism, a man that sits on the cutting edge of the news media business. And I'm Martin Nutty. And I'm John Lee. Welcome all of you to another edition of our Global Irish Nation Conversation here on Irish Stew. This episode of Irish Stew is sponsored by the Irish Heritage Tree Program. Celebrate your Irish roots by planting native trees for family and friends in the beautiful Golden Vale of Ireland. Go to irishheritagetree.com and use the exclusive discount code today. It's irishstew10 for 10% off. That code again is irishstew and the numeral 10. Keep the heritage of Ireland green and growing by going to irishheritagetree.com. Hey, we want to welcome everybody back to another uh, Global Irish Conversation here on Irish Stew. Martin, what do we have in store for the listeners today? Delighted to be back on the podcast. Um, Got an interesting episode coming up. We're actually recording this episode on May 3rd. And there's an awful lot going on in the news media business at the moment. Last week, Fox News agreed to pay a $787 million defamation settlement to Dominion Voting Systems. That was swiftly followed by the firing of Tucker Carlson, that network's most popular primetime host. More defamation lawsuits are in the offing, not just for Fox News, but also other media outlets. Meanwhile, smaller news organizations are struggling. BuzzFeed is shuttering its news operation, while Vice News also appears to be in trouble. And with all that playing out in the background, I'm delighted to welcome our next guest, who has been working in the trenches of the news business for more than 30 years, both as a reporter and an executive. He lists CNN, Storyful, and now Mather Economics on his resume. And with that, welcome, David Clinch. Thank you, Martin and John. Good morning to both of you. And yes, I I have sometimes been described as the... uh, the zealot of the news industry. I, I mm-hmm. pop up at, at every stage of pretty much everything that you've just just described happening now is uh, is part of my career over the last few years. So, yes, we live in interesting times. Yes, we are cursed to live in interesting times. David, I'll just give you my personal uh, reminiscence of meeting you. It probably was a dozen years ago, right about this time of the year uh, at uh, a kind of global Irish think tank called Tangible Ireland, run by mm-hmm. Raymond Sexton. I wonder if you recall that. I absolutely do. Yeah, it's great. Uh, Raymond was, and you, were both one of the great uh, connecting tissues for young Irish journalists. Um, I had lived here, obviously, in America for, for a while, but in early storyful days, there were very few Irish media or technology connections, certainly not on the East Coast in New York. And it was great to to have you and, and Raymond and others organize those get-togethers uh, back in those days. Strange, strangely enough, I will be seeing Raymond in a couple of hours. He's back in town. Good. Well, please please give him my best. Now now New York is infested with young <laughs> Irish journalists. And the, the Storyful Alumni Network, which I'm now a proud member of, is um, uh, which I am very proudly a member of, is... Uh, is dominating in some ways the the media scene in New York, but that was not the case 10, 15 years ago. Yeah, we certainly uh, want to talk about Storyful a bit in the course of this episode, but what I want to do is start out this way. I've booked a very fancy restaurant on your behalf. You get to decide uh, who the guests are, but they have to be from the news media. Could be past or present. Tell me, 
who you pick, assuming everybody accepts your invitation, <laughs> and why? So I have three people to invite and myself. Yes. Um, well, just off the top of my head, I would invite uh, Emily Bell from the School of Journalism at um, at the Tau Centre, to be more precise, at Columbia University, who's a colleague and friend of mine for many years. I might invite Margaret Sullivan, who was former um, uh, New York Times and Washington Post and now writes for The Guardian on the subject of journalism. And um, I might invite my old colleague Mark Little as well from Storyful Days. And I think the four of us all know each other and have a not it was a conversation that we're having together, but a conversation that we've had with each other that I would love to continue over a very expensive dinner that somebody else was paying for uh, about um, what I euph euphemistically call uh, a short history of the future of news, mm -hmm. which is the, the never ending discussion of, of what the future of news is and how the, the end of news and journalism is impending doom. And yet, there's always something interesting, always something exciting to talk about with those three people. So those would be my choices, and that would be my subject. Martin, did we commit to picking up the check for this? Oh, I think Mark should definitely pick up the check for it. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. Some of that yeah, we've stuff. had the pleasure, of course, of uh, hosting your, for, your former colleague, Mark Little. And it was interesting that you used the kind of the words future and history because of course he's just uh had it launched a new podcast which is uh, i think called uh the history of the future which is actually excellent on the subject of the changes in journalism i've been really enjoying listening to that it is it's it's really broader though it's 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 beyond journalism that's a mm -hmm. fascinating subject to me and yeah and the, the, those three people and there are many many others i'm very lucky to to have direct personal connections with with dozens, hundreds maybe of, of journalists and people who have lived and breathed um, journalism over the last 33 plus years that I've been a journalist, or I, I now describe myself as a former journalist, but as I was a journalist over those three decades. And the, the conversation about where journalism is going and how soon the end is coming for one version of it or another has never ended. I, when I started in journalism, in the in the late eighties, the discussion was you know just beginning about the switch to digital. But that was literally just instead of splicing film, you were recording on a digital tape, you know. And then many years later, the New York Times was transforming to digital. But that literally just meant that an article could be published on the website before it was printed in the newspaper. So any and all thresholds of the impending end of journalism because of the changes in technology um, have always been discussed with great passion in, in my circles of people who care about journalism. But then after three decades, you also realize that there's no single technological change that is going to define the future of journalism. Journalism will happen in the crack of a wall if that's the only thing that's left, if that's the only space that's left. The, the journalism will still happen. But what dominates the conversations that I'm in is what is the business of journalism that supports that uh, craft and that art and that important act of journalism? What, what allows journalism to happen, especially authoritative journalism, which tends to be or can be expensive? And, and th those are the things that I have become fascinated by in the last, uh, certainly last few years. So, in order to really kind of understand anybody's story, we always like to ask about origins. And as I understand it, your childhood origin was split over both Ireland and England. Tell us a little bit about that background. That's correct. I'm aging myself here, but um, my first encounter with media was probably on the day I was born. Um, Winston Churchill died, and I was born <laughs> in England. So I probably some somebody somewhere in the background was playing the BBC announcement of Winston Churchill's death. Um, thank God I wasn't named Winston; I was named David. Mm -hmm. But I was born in England because my parents, both of whom are, are Irish from very different backgrounds in Ireland, but um, as happens when people move abroad, they had both 
uh, come to, or were both working in England at the time. My mother grew up in England, but was from a family in Cork, a very working class fam family in Cork. My dad uh, was born in Ireland and grew up um, some of his youth in Ireland, some in England. And they were both working for Ford Motor Company in Dagenham in Essex in the 60s. And so myself and two of my three brothers were born in England. But we moved back to Ireland when I was very young. So I don't really remember those first few years in England, except for the fact that I am told I had a fairly pronounced English Essex accent when I was very young. And that was beaten out of me fairly quickly when I arrived <laughs> back in Ireland. Um, and then grew up in Ireland, you know, so don't really, didn't really <clears throat> remember those years in England, but grew up in Ireland, went to Belvedere, went to Trinity, which was sort of your fate if you were a clinch in Dublin at the time. There was there was a, a clinch in every year in Belvedere when mm -hmm. I was there and, you know, clinches all over the place. So you were never yourself in my family or always somebody's brother or uncle or son or nephew. And so it was both a wonderful upbringing in Ireland, but also to some degree constricting for me personally. And, uh, you know, I was always fascinated growing up in the 70s and 80s in Ireland in a sort of a Bono-esque way about the rest of the world and, and the role that Irish people could play. And in those days, it was very much a kind of a potential that Irish mm -hmm. people could play. But then people um, like Bono and, and others started to pave the way for how Irish young Irish people could go out into the world and have a voice way beyond the parochial con confines of Dublin or Ireland or Catholicism or anything else. And that, that's the atmosphere I grew up in, is that mm. I lived in Ireland. I loved, loved Ireland. I loved being Irish. But I was always fascinated by the, the idea that being Irish and speaking English, for instance, gave you this pathway to the rest of the world. And uh, <clears throat> communication was the key. So well before I was interested in journalism, I was interested in communication. I just was fascinated by the technology of, of pirate radio, and for instance. like My first job in journalism, if you want to call it that, was that a friend of mine ran a, or a brother of a friend of mine, <clears throat> ran a pirate radio station, which I think was based in the back of a caravan that drove around North Dublin at the time I was in school. And we would rip out the uh, football results from the Evening Herald and then go and read them on the pirate radio station in the evening. So that my first experience of curation was basically stealing content from somewhere else and reading it on a pirate radio. Well, that, that could open up, as we get into this a little further, that could open up some great discussions about the kind of curation of news and who's actually making the profit on the journalist's work and... Uh, you know, get into AI. Where's where's all that information coming from? But uh, before we get there, um, I, we noticed that you had a foray into theater. It sounded like coming out of Trinity, you had not completely set your path in life, which we often find uh, the the case with our guests. Uh, but what I I don't know what your involvement with theater was, but I'm struck by the storytelling yeah. aspect of theater. Well, again, communication, storytelling. I suppose I again there was no training for journalism back in those days in 70s or 80s. If there had been, I might have studied that in university, but I didn't. I studied French and philosophy at Trinity, mostly because I was more or less fluent in French and didn't have to work at it very hard. And because I wanted to play rugby and I wanted to act in the theatre. I acted in Belvedere. I wanted to act in the Players um, Theatre in Trinity. And that was my passion. And after I, just to to re restate my interest in journalism was also uh, defined by the fact that my dad had brought me in a few years earlier to some contact he had high up in RT and said, you know, my son wants to be in, in media. And the fellow who will remain unnamed talked to me for a while and realized I couldn't speak any Irish and that I had a very vague understanding of what journalism or media was about and just basically told me I'd never get a job at RT. So I had sort of shelved any idea of journalism and was concentrating on theater and left Trinity and left Dublin, as many people did in the late 80s. And almost all of my friends and relatives left Ireland in those days, or certainly more than half. Went to London to try and work in the theater. And basically, it turned out that I wasn't good enough. I wasn't really an actor. I was trying to be a director at that point, And it just didn't work out. But as a perchance, trying to work in the theater and basically pulling up the 
the uh, the uh, uh, curtain on a West End theatre for a few months. I had been able to join the union that crossed over from the theatre to television, or at least at the sort of lower level of television jobs. And so I just kept applying for television jobs because they paid slightly more than theatre jobs did. So I got in a job at ITN as a freelancer, and I only got it and I was only interested in it because I said I could use a computer, which wasn't really true. And because the money, the beer money was basically slightly better. So I am a completely and utterly an accidental journalist. I was attracted to the idea of a media journalism environment, but I knew nothing about journalism. But the more I stayed at ITN and just kept saying yes to things, they were starting a new morning program on Channel 4 News in the late 80s. I got involved in that as a researcher. Uh, then shortly after that, in the 90s, in the very early 90s, uh, the Gulf War happened. CNN became a great uh, affiliate partnership uh, between ITN and CNN. So I became aware of CNN. In fact, I was in the newsroom the day that the Gulf War bombing of Baghdad started. And I remember seeing Stu Stuart Purvis, who was the top man at ITN at the time, running around like a headless chicken saying, somebody call CNN, somebody call CNN, because that was the moment when CNN owned the story. And I didn't know much about CNN, but that immediately turned my mind on to the idea that there was a whole new world out there in America of 24-hour news and global news that I still had not experienced. So I stayed at ITN for a while and, uh, you know, became a journalist, but still very much kind of not sure how serious I was. But then as with other things in life, you know, I didn't work in theater, so I ended up working in television. Then I met an American woman in London who... I decided I want to spend the rest of my life with. And cutting a very long, very romantic story short, I basically applied for a job at CNN over the phone. I think I faxed them my resume. They gave me the job, but I had to, be, had to have a visa. In order to have a visa, I had to get married. So I came to America to work for CNN, CNN in 1991 uh, on a fiancé visa and had to get married within 90 days. So... That's how I became a journalist is not through a thoughtful process or training. It was beer money and then turning out I was pretty good at it and then basically following my heart to America. David, just uh, my, my story is uh, I was on the other end of that fiancé equation. I brought my wife, my future wife in from Italy. All right. Well, 33 years later, we're still married. So it, it wasn't just for the green card that <laughs> I, I did it. But uh, but that's, you know, that's the story of how I, you know, when I came here and then started working at CNN, I, I sort of realized I had an existential moment. I realized that I had an opportunity to be a journalist. And CNN in those days, in the early 90s, was suddenly this massive magnet of people from all over the world who wanted to come. And, you know, I, I'm not going to say I gave up everything for Ted Turner and, you know, sort of a messianic uh, feeling about the future of journalism. But in retrospect, there were a lot of people like me who gave up a lot and, and, you know, switched their entire lives to come and live in Atlanta and not earn very much money in order to do journalism and to do it in a way that it had never done been done before. And I got to travel the world. CNN in those days was like the journalistic equivalent of joining the Navy. You know, I went to Moscow, I went to Gaza, I went to the West Bank, I went to Egypt, I went to um, you know, Paris, I was in Belfast with the Good Friday Agreement with CNN, uh, Caribbean lying on a beach covering a story, you know, you, you just all of the great um, things that can happen to you when you're part of a big global network. But also, it was a team, it was a team that was very tight, and very dedicated to truly meaningful journalism, not perfect all the time. But, and you know, maybe some very, um, valid criticisms of CNN even back then, but it was definitely about the journalism. The journalism was the star. And I'm very lucky that I had that period of time when I got to be a part of that team that was very single-minded and dedicated. So tell us about being Irish in CNN, or maybe I'm assuming your ITN experience in London factored into this. Uh, obviously, you weren't put on the uh, domestic United States beat. Was that part of that, you think, just simply uh, you had that worldview as a product of being an Irish person? And was that recognized in CNN? It's interesting. You think about it, even 
at ITN, for instance, one of the things that was very strange for me and very hard for me, and I think probably one of the reasons I left London, is that, you know, I had been born in England and I didn't think I was English. I thought I was Irish, but I, I never thought that I would ever be uncomfortable in England. But I came into ITN sort of from the bottom up. You know, I wasn't an Oxbridge graduate. I wasn't, I wasn't coming in as a journalist. I was basically a worker in the research library. And yes, people didn't know what to make of me. I didn't fit into any box culturally, you know, for them. I, I wasn't English, but I didn't really sound Irish. And they really weren't sure what the hell to make of me. And then when I came to America, the great thing was that everyone, of course, would comment and say, oh, I love your accent. And so there, I was definitely foreign. But at the same time, nobody gave a toss who I was or what school I went to or who my dad was or anything else. And there was a great leveling effect. And then at CNN in particular, everybody was from somewhere. I, I mean, I did, to answer your question, I, I, they didn't have to ask me. I went straight for the international desk. That's where I wanted to work. Ted Turner wouldn't let you use the word foreign in those days. You'd get fined if you used the word foreign. He called it the international desk. And that was the place to work at CNN in those days. There had never been a foreign desk like this. Maybe the BBC would be comparable. But, you know, this was the center of the world. You, you knew about everything happening in the world before anybody else did. That was the place everybody wanted to work. And so, yes, I probably was welcomed into that because I had an international background and spoke some languages. But it was also what I wanted immediately. It just, you know, having not thought that much about journalism up until that point, I was very thoughtful and purposeful and intentional about connecting to the international desk. That was, you know, your your theme is global Irish. I mean, I literally was, um, as were many other people in those days, the personification of that. I had had a global perspective my whole life growing up in Ireland. And then suddenly I had the ability to... Uh, to do that, to actually put that into practice. You know, what does a global perspective mean? If you have to cover every story all over the world, is a story in Africa more important than a story in Asia? You know, are, are people of one color more important than another color? You have to actually put that into practice when you're working in that environment. You have to have a very egalitarian, very global, very non-polar perspective in order to do that job well. And that's what we were. We were a team of people. There were, of course, many Americans there, but they also had global perspectives. And there were, it was just a, it, it was a team gathered around the idea that you could cover every part of the world as if it was as important as any other. David, looking at the, that uh, Irish identity question that Martin raised from a different perspective, when you're out there on the front lines of journalism, the, you know, Moscow, the West Bank, um, did that Irish identity, that Irish accent, was it a door opener in any way? Did it kind of lower the the temperature around the potential American journalist coming at someone? Yeah, well, there are two interesting aspects to that. One, just very briefly, is that I, for instance, could have had and maybe should have had American citizenship and a passport very early. And, you know, within a year or two of being married, I was naturalized and could have had a passport, but I chose not to in those days because it was actually very useful to not have an American passport in your back pocket if you were in certain parts of the world. Now, I think I probably stretched that excuse for many more years than I needed to. In other words, it was sort of a good talking point, but eventually, you know, I certainly, I am now an American citizen. I became one many, many years ago, but, but it was useful and important to have an Irish passport. It was a door opener. But it was also useful in some ways not. If you were being chosen for particular teams to go to particular particular places, having an American passport could have possibly been, uh, you know, a danger, or an unnecessary danger. So that was the rationale for my passport situation. But in terms of the accent, I mean, yeah, it's not really just the accent. It's the perspective. Again, just there are Irish Irish lovers all over the world. You, you can go to a, you know, cover a story of a riot in the West Bank and then stop on the way home to back to Jerusalem in Bethlehem to get some hummus out of the wall and walk into a shop next door to the hummus restaurant. And there's a Palestinian guy who speaks fluent Irish because he used to go out with an Irish girl and loves Irish people and, you know, gives you a a free uh, piece of clothing, clothing for your children because he, he just loves Irish people. So it doesn't matter where you are in the world. There's almost always an Irish pub, and there certainly is always an Irish, um, an openness to Irish people. 
that is not available to every other <clears throat> culture. And of course, here in America, um, you know, Irish being Irish opens all sorts of doors. It's just a ridiculous uh, pass that you get, you know, that takes you into the higher levels of conversation with government people, with media people, with others. Um, and, you know, when Mark founded Storyful and I joined later, there is absolutely no, no doubt in my mind <clears throat> that our Irishness was a big factor in opening doors. Now, you uh, just segued us very nicely there because uh, you mentioned Storyful, and after 19 odd years at CNN, you decided to do the unthinkable to some people's way of looking at things by leaving, let's say, a safer existence in journalism, uh, dipping your toe into startup world. Talk to me about risk taking and explain to our listeners a little bit uh about storyful we've had the pleasure obviously of hosting mark little uh, and talking about that a little bit but uh, i'd be interested in your experience there as a co-founder of storyful well mark was the founder i i i joined as a you know founding early member or you know early member of the team uh it's mark's uh um company and, and was at the time. And, and we were very lucky. Mark and I had been in college in Trinity around the same time back in the, in the, in the previous lives. And we had reconnected over the years a few times at, at, through media things when he was at RT and I was at CNN. And then sort of became friends again and then reconnected through Twitter. And really that's the origin story of Storyful in a way is that he and I and a few others um, around the world started to realize the potential of social media. And we'd come from a slightly different perspectives. I was still at CNN, and I was warning people within CNN that uh, the social media um, wave that was coming was both a massive opportunity, but also a huge danger if it was not properly managed and curated and, and filtered in a way. And it was not necessarily, my message was not necessarily very well received. So I was in my last few years at CNN trying to build systems and tools to, to harness the power of social media. But I wasn't quite sure where to go with that. And Mark, I think, you know, was still at RT, but thinking about taking a break and starting Storyful around the idea of storytelling and there always being somebody closer to the story. And that, you know, before we really used the term user-generated content, it was about eyewitness content and people who were there to tell the story in a way that a journalist couldn't. And basically, we're both married to Americans, so we would sort of meet irregularly in Dublin, and our two wives would just get sick and tired of us talking about leaving and leaving our great jobs and going off to do whatever we were going to do, this ill-defined thing. And then we would meet again and get more serious about it and again. And I think eventually, uh, you know, everyone who knew us realized that something was going to happen. And Mark took the first step, left RT, founded Storyful, put the team together. And it worked very well, conveniently for us, that I was still based in America. So when I left CNN and then later uh, joined Storyful a short while later, what advantage that that gave us is that we had a foot on both sides of the Atlantic. And we also had the two sort of, um, they weren't ever competing, but the two sort of pillars were systems to find the news on social media and then helping the stories emerge. And that's what Storyful is. It's a combination of those two things. It's a combination of journalism and technology and always has been and always will be. But it's also a combination of journalism skills being applied in a very real-time environment uh, that nobody really thought was possible when we first started. The idea that you could put a system in place to verify the most important video, to verify the most important images, to spot fakes, to quickly identify the most valuable content, that was deemed to be, there's, there's too much out there. You'll never be able to do it. And one of the things that we did, which was in some ways a very un-Irish thing to do, was that we applied systematic approach to that, right? It, in the end, there was a very Irish storytelling aspect to it uh, and a very global communication aspect to it that was very Irish. But the sort of American angle, if you want to put it that way, was that we took a very systematic technological approach to it and you put those two things together and Storyful did not solve all of the problems of verification 
But I'm very, very proud of the fact that, you know, 15 years later, uh, the processes uh, the processes that we started and developed are now adopted across almost the entire industry globally, at least certainly in any serious news organization. If you don't have real-time verification and real-time, um, you know, rights clearance for video and images, you're not doing your job properly. So it was a, it was a small thing that turned into a big thing, but its, it's impact has been even bigger than just the, the impact of Storyful as a company itself too. We were lucky enough to, to be acquired. And then, you know, Mark left a little while after that. I stayed for many years and just left a couple of years ago. And I'm very proud of how big Storyful has become, but I'm even more proud of the impact that it had in the journalism industry. And as I've mentioned to you both before, I'm extremely proud to now be a, a, a Storyful alumni network member, because if you think about the impact that people like Mark and Anya Kerr obviously have had and Maliki Brown and Doni O'Sullivan. I mean, these people are are incredible, uh, you know, flag wavers for the future of journalism. If, if anyone is worried about the future of journalism, look at the Storyful Alumni Network. It's making waves everywhere in the world. And so it it was, like all things Irish, it was a fortuitous uh, connection made mostly in pubs in the early days before we actually found it. And actually, there were still a lot of meetings in pubs even after we were in business. That that's There was an Irishness to Storyful all the way through, and there still is. But it had just the right dose of, of American um, sort of technological uh, forethought involved in it as well. D- David, uh, t- tell us a little bit about the kind of the, the new power you unleashed uh at at Storyful with uh, with the way you were able to bring in that sort of crowdsourced user generated content that was previously unavailable, you talked about how this kind of content can give you a three hundred and sixty view. What, what did you mean there? Well, I will tell you that that was mostly aspirational and you know very sort of rosy rose tinted uh, Irish eyes. Um, idea at the beginning. But the idea has come to fruition. The best way to answer your question is to look at what's being done now. You know, Maliki Brown worked at at Storyful for many years and then left to to join the New York Times. And a few Pulitzer Prize um, wins later, the team that operates at the New York Times and many other teams that operate at other formerly newspaper operations in the United States and around the world are doing forensic storytelling journalism in a way that could never have happened if it wasn't for um, <clears throat> the contribution of entities like Storyful and Bellingcat and others. There, there is a new approach to journalism, real-time journalism, forensic digital journalism, that I think Storyful did help unleash. Again, it was not the only power behind that, but it was it was a it it required a form, and Storyful was one of the earliest forms of that kind of journalism. They're, they're, it's now taken for granted that that exists across the whole industry. But the other thing that you have to think about Storyful is that it was also about trying to make money from this content as well. It was about winning awards, and it was also about making money. One of the things that, you know, going back to CNN days, uh, we always used to joke that Larry King paid for the Baghdad Bureau. You have to have something that supports mm-hmm. your journalism, right? And one of the magic things about Storyful was that, that while we were very much more interested as journalists in the hard news and the digital verification, that digital verification was just as important for the viral video that was going to make somebody hundreds of thousands of dollars. And if you didn't take mm-hmm. that seriously, you wouldn't make your money and you wouldn't make money for your clients and your partners. And so we took the approach from the very beginning that it was just as important to to verify the silly viral videos as it was to verify the important ones um, for, from from a news story, and that has actually proved very important later because now we're in a world where you can fake anything. You can fake a viral video. You can fake a political video. Donny O'Sullivan did a story just this week at CNN about an entirely AI generated political ad that the Republican Party did. Right. So it, in our approach. Uh, being centered around the importance of journalism, we sort of accidentally also created an approach that's very important for the entire content set across viral videos and everything else, 
but there's also just a fundamental base application of journalism within society. And that is best described as don't trust anything. Don't even trust yourself online. You have to verify everything. And our approach at Storyful was don't trust anything. Don't even trust yourself. Always get verification. Always get proof. Always get second opinions. Always get uh, another perspective. And even one video showing something definitively you, you need another angle or a third angle or a fourth angle to be absolutely certain of what you're seeing. So our impact, I think, at Storyful was way beyond just the wonderful things that it achieved in journalism and in terms of making money with videos. It also is a, is a fundamental part of the way people need to li live their lives nowadays. Mm -hmm. it, it also rubs up against the subject I'm very interested in, which is the value of journalism. And people don't necessarily care that much about journalism. And if they don't care about journalism, why should it be valued by society? And I think that you're, you're at an interesting inflection point where one of the things at, at Storyful that we always would push back on a little bit was the idea of citizen journalism. I mean, we, we toyed with that phrase for a while, but in the end, there's no such thing as citizen journalism. You're either a journalist or you're a citizen, right? And if you're a citizen, your content has to be verified. If you're a journalist, it has to be verified. But now you're in a world where people don't know the difference. A lot of the audience does not know the difference between a journalist and a non-journalist, an influencer or an eyewitness. And it's, it's become a little bit dangerous out there because the sources of content and information are so widespread and so uh, muxed together that it's very hard now to distinguish yourself as a, a, a source of proper, full journalism because everybody has an opinion, everybody's producing content. And that's very concerning for me that journalism has lost its way a little bit. Yeah, you're touching on an area that I find particularly interesting. Um, I wonder if you have any thoughts on the status of journalism in the United States versus, let's say, in Western Europe. So in the United States, it strikes me that there are certain members of the political class that are aggressively attacking journalism. Um, so talk to us a little bit about that, a little bit of a compare and contrast. Well, I would rather say that I think that America is a few, as, as often happens, is a few years ahead of Western Europe and the rest of the world when it comes to the status of journalism. And, um, and not in a good way, necessarily. And if you, what you're looking at in America right now, which is, as you mentioned, um, you know, huge challenges at the top of the pile in journalism here in the United States, where newspapers and others get attacked by politicians all the time. And then just from a business perspective, a lot of the digital startups and others that were meant to change that model and broaden the appeal of journalism have either failed or are failing. And so you have a you have a sort of a perfect storm of a high incentive from political parties of all kinds, but particularly on the edges on both sides here in America to attack journalism because it it it, it gives them some of the power that otherwise journalism would hold. And then you don't necessarily have an alternative sor source of journal journalism that is coming up behind that that is more trustworthy. Um, you know, the idea was with some of these digital startups was that they would be they would be the trust center for the next generation, that younger people would put trust in a brand like Vice or BuzzFeed or something else because they, you know, had given up on the New York Times or CNN or, or the Wall Street Journal and they were seeking new places to that understood them and spoke to them. Well, the problem with that is that the business models were not there, right? But I also believe that the problem was that that was never really going to be the case. It was never a young audience are not stupid. They were never going to have the same level of trust in a news organization that did, um, you know, viral videos and news. They were never going to have the same level of trust in a, in a brand um, that, you know, didn't have the resources that the New York Times and others have. So you're kind of caught in a catch-22. Trust has been set up in journalism 
as being equated to heavily resourced, very well-established brands that are very expensive to run and only a certain amount of people consume them. And then other news is maybe trusted in some ways by other audiences, but it's not distinguished but, uh, as news and as journalism. It's just content. It's just there. You know, BuzzFeed is the same as Facebook, you know, in a lot of people's minds. TikTok is is the same as, um, you know, whatever other news brand you want to mention. You, you just get into this big ocean of brandless, nameless content. And the problem then becomes is, you just only have those very large news organizations that still retain a lot of trust, but not everybody is consuming them. Not everybody is reading them. Not everybody is watching them. And then the rest of the audiences are just, uh, you know, consuming all kinds of stuff all the time and not distinguishing, to, distinguishing between what is authoritative and what isn't. So to answer your question about Western Europe versus America, I think what you're seeing here now is a real crisis here because now political sides, perhaps the right more than the left, but both sides in some ways, are smelling blood in the water. They basically realize that they can go past media straight to the people they want to speak to. They don't, it's nice if they get mentioned in the New York Times, but it could also be risky, right? So why bother? Why bother having the filter of journalism between you and people? And that's their right, of course. Politicians have the right to speak to people. They should always be able to speak to people. But if people, audiences increasingly don't get that information filtered through journalism and filtered through the, the ability that journalism has to add context, then politicians can say and do whatever they want, right? And they are speaking directly to audiences. I think you've already seen that in the UK, certainly in Brexit years, and you see it in Ireland a little bit, and you certainly see it in in France and Germany and other places, it's coming. And I think the same crisis will exist in Western Europe that exists here in, in America soon, is that elite brands will be seen as elite and other brands will just mux in with everything else. And politicians, especially ones that have authoritarian um, desires, will want to just bypass all of that and speak to audiences directly. And again, that's their right. It's not, it's not journalism doesn't have the right to be between the people and politicians. That's not our right. We can't sit on an ivory tower and assume that right. But journalism has a duty to try to communicate to as many people as possible what is happening in the world with added context. And if you lose that, society loses. So you raised the word context there. Um, when I think about journalism, uh, it strikes me that there's three aspects um, to my layman's view of it. One is news gathering, newsroom type of activity. Another is the analysis that sits on top of that. And then finally, we have opinion. And I opened up the podcast with a reference towards the massive $787 million settlement uh, that Fox News has agreed to pay to Dominion voting systems. What does that tell us about the state of journalism that all of a sudden now the large enterprises like Fox News are vulnerable uh, to significant lawsuit activity or significant lawsuits. Um, is that changing um, the field of play? And if so, is that change healthy or is it problematic? Well, the answer is we're not sure yet, right? Because it was an inconclusive, it was a very expensive result for Fox. And we are yet, we are still seeing other fallout. You mentioned that Tucker Carlson was let go a while ago. And then there's even more stories coming out since then about Fox, which could, could continue to damage Fox and have the impact of making Fox and others that are very opinion centered think twice before uh, airing opinions that are unverified or misleading or lies. But that is not what the court decided. <laughs> the court decided to let it happen outside the realm of jurisdiction and to go into just basically a, a payment. But I think you, I at least, can infer from that judgment and from the payment that Fox News made is that there is a realization that journalism is quite rightfully 
uh, protected by the First Amendment here in the United States. And that is a wonderful thing that the U.S. has that I think every other country should look at because it is just absolutely fundamentally simple. The government, you know, cannot tell you what to say, right? And free press is protected um, And in the Second Amendment. And I think that if you think about the impact that this um, big payment from Fox has, it would certainly indicate that there is no protection for opinion that is not verified. There is no protection for somebody having their own point of view about something and saying something that is not true. If that, if that is said accidentally and then corrected, then it stays comfortably within the realm of opinion journalism, which is, you know, it, which is corrected or, you know, quickly adjusted. But if, if you relentlessly, continuously lie, and you know you're lying, or you know that the people that you're talking to are lying, and you're amplifying that without any context, without any verification, and you know that you're doing that, that is not protected speech in any way at all. And I think that the judge, you know, didn't decide that. But I think, and that's probably a good thing, because I think it would get messy if it went up to the current Supreme Court here in the United States. I'd, it would be a be careful what you ask for situation situation if those kinds of cases ended up in the Supreme Court right now. But what it does is it reaffirms the status quo here in the U.S., is that journalism is protected. Warts and all, mistakes, errors, you know, correct them. You, you get something wrong. You, you say you got it wrong. That's journalism, right? But opinion is protected, but not lies, not continued damaging lies. That's not journalism. You have the, absolutely the right to go and do that. You absolutely have the right in America to go and lie to anyone you want. But if you do it under the guise of journalism or try to, and it creates damage in your audience and in society, again, you can do it, but there will be consequences. It's not protected. So I think that there was a half message in the payment that Fox had to make, and that is, you can do it, but it'll be expensive. But it didn't really move the goalposts in terms of the law. The law remains the same, and maybe it could do with a little bit more clarification at some point, but I personally think that it, it would have been risky for it to go up further in courts because there's no guarantee that the current Supreme Court in the United States would protect journalism in the same way or define journalism in the same way as it has previously been defined. So, David, uh, let's move uh, for you to the present and into the future. What are you doing these days and, and what do you got on the horizon? Uh, well, as I mentioned, I left Storyful a couple of years ago now, which was, you know, the time was right there. There were uh, no bridges burned when I left CNN, no bridges burned when I left Storyful. This, we live in a glass house here in the journalism world, and there's no point in ever looking backwards. So I took some time off after leaving Storyful and wasn't sure exactly what I was going to do. But I had become increasingly involved in and interested in the business of journalism over the last few years. My role at Storyful, a current role that I have with Mather Economics and my own consultancy, Media Growth Partners, are all focused now on helping news organizations build business models. But another very important part of that is that in thinking about business models and thinking about the sustainability of journalism, I began to realize that you couldn't really do that and get the funding that you needed, get the audiences that you needed, and get the growth that you needed if you didn't also have a value proposition. So it was, it's been very interesting for me going through the startup process and uh, you know seeing what, what it requires to have a value proposition, like being constantly challenged by investors and by clients and by others, like well, what's the value prop, as they see, say here in America, right? Well, so as I think about journalism, I began to realize more and more and more that it, I could not just assume that the value proposition of journalism was, was clearly stated. I could not assume that everybody thought that journalism was as valuable as I thought it would be. And I also began to realize that, you know, people talk about journalism and say, well, there should be more journalism. There should be, you know, less news deserts and there should be more news outlets. Well, what I've also learned over the years is that all news is not equal and that you could have something that sets itself up as a news outlet, and it could be complete crap, basically. It could be pink slime. It could just be, uh, you know, just publishing, God knows now, you know, AI-produced news that is just completely useless to anybody, right? But it might make money because it, it, it'll connect to advertising, and 
you know, if you run it inexpensively, it might make money. So it, it became very important to me to understand that what I was trying to do was not support the future of news. I was trying to support the future of journalism, local journalism. And of course, that's connected at the hip to the news industry and to the publishing industry and to the digital industry. But if it doesn't start with quality journalism, then I'm not interested, right? And if it starts with quality journalism, how can I persuade people, funders, others that are, might be interested in supporting uh, journalism, how can I persuade them of the value? And in some ways, there, you, you have two ironic problems. You're preaching to the converted in lots of ways to people who, who want to support journalism, but at the same time, they're increasingly demanding um, visibility into their investments. Well, how can I track the value of my investment into journalism? I'm just, I keep giving money and money and money, and nothing changes, right? So there's a big change happening here in the United States that I think is going to flow around the world very soon, where big funders of journalism, who are obviously, they are the converted, they're the ones who believe in it. They are increasingly saying, if we're going to invest in the future of journalism, it has to be about sustainable business models, and it has to be about authoritative journalism. And so we're not just throwing money all over the place. We want to show for sure that our money is going towards something sustainable and something that has an impact, right? And then in the, on the audience side, why should anybody out there care whether I'm doing authoritative journalism or not if they don't understand what journalism is, if they don't understand how important it is? And all of these other things that in the democratic society are measured and visualized and shown and tracked as being important parts of a democratic society, journalism is not. There's nowhere, there's nowhere for me to look and see what the impact is of local news in my community or in my city or my state. I just, I can't, I, I might have a concept of it, but I, I can't look and see it. So I am determined to solve both of those problems at the same time, create better ways for investment, to uh, create sustainability for authoritative journalism, and to be able to visualize and track that impact in society. Mm. And so I'm spending a lot of my fourth act here in my life uh, in supporting the future of news in that way. There are lots of other things that can be done. Obviously, people have to produce the actual journalism, but my journalism days are over. My, my contribution from this point on is to create better frameworks for funding and tracking the impact of journalism. That's really interesting, the tracking aspect. I never really thought of it in those terms. Well, yeah, I mean, you, you, you can go to a map of public data and you can track over a period of time what the broadband um, availability is in a state or a, or a postal code in Ireland or in America. You can look and see how many people have access to broadband. But can you go and look at exactly how many people have access to a news outlet? And can you look at the impact that that reporting has? It's just, it's, it's all inferred. It's all this ivory tower. Well, of course, journalism is important. We don't have to prove it. We don't have to show it. And of course, I'm not talking about turning journalism just into data and just measuring it in some way. But if you don't show and illustrate the impact of it um, in, in, in a better way than just anecdotes or qualitative um, measurement, then why, why should audiences care, right? And so I think that there's definitely something to the idea of visualizing and tracking that impact. Mm. It strikes me that these are the two probably most important points right now in the world of journalism is almost an educational process on the consumer of news. There needs to be more literacy because there's a welter of information being provided across the internet, etc. Is there part of your brief as you see it going forward an effort to say okay uh you've just come across a news story on the web what are the checkpoints one needs to tick off before you believe that that story is actually valid or useful or etc is would you consider that kind of effort to be part of what you're talking about I do, and I think there are wonderful efforts out there in, in like News Brands Ireland does a great uh, educational effort in schools, schools in Ireland, media-wise here in the U.S. of teaching younger people and younger audiences 
uh, how to have critical thinking. And, you know, of course, again, talking about taking things for granted, you would assume that most people going through school would learn about critical thinking and learn to apply that. But increasingly, that is challenged even in, in schools here and around the world is critical thinking and, and, and uh, you know, things like literature and others are not emphasized as much as they used to. So I'm all about educational aspects. But I also, from a practical point of view, think that there is no better way to get audiences engaged in the understanding what journalism is than to show them your work, right? And interestingly, digital forensic journalism, the kind that Storyfill started and is now used everywhere, is actually a wonderful way to get people fascinated by and turned on to the amazing aspects of verification. Like just the magic wizard, wizardry of, of a Bellingcat or a you know, New York Times investigation into something in Ukraine or or elsewhere, just the incredible forensics of how did you intercept that audio? How did you correlate it to the exact time in the video? You know, how did you know how many bullets were fired? All of these just amazing parts of the process, which are normally hidden behind and only turn up in one shot in a, in a package. If you expose your process and talk about the challenges and what your level of certainty is about things and how you make decisions about what to report, I think that engages audiences just because it's very cool, Mm -hmm. but also because it it then encourages them to apply the same kind of forensic thinking in their lives, in what they're seeing and what they're doing. Like, oh, I saw that CNN piece about an AI political ad. How do I know that this other ad isn't AI? How do I know that that image isn't AI? So I think there's showing and exposing the process of verification, digital verification in particular, is you don't have to it doesn't have to be a hammer over the head you don't you don't have to overdo it right but you can just by telling the story and also exposing the process as you go you can actually encourage your audience to then go out and be you know apostles for you in the world of saying hey you don't believe everything you see i just saw this piece that made me think twice about things that i see so i think education is a part of it but i think that journalism actually has created an opportunity for itself in the new form of journalism that exists about pretty much any story that happens everywhere requires now multiple levels of verification, multiple levels of certainty about what you're seeing and hearing. Don't believe your eyes. Don't believe your ears. Don't believe any, but anything that anybody says, verify everything. And if you can help your audience understand that and how important it is to do that, they will first of all, trust you more. And then secondly, they will take some of that skill set themselves into their own lives. David, uh, you know, you, you brought up local news, which sounds like an increasing focus for you. Uh, you know, we the, there's like the idea that the news is out there, but we're, we're not seeing it. Uh, we had the case recently of the election of George Santos, who appears to have been uh, fraudulent in every aspect of his biography and possible criminal activities. Uh, everybody was like, how come we didn't know this beforehand? Uh, a local paper, a local news outlet, do it yep. beforehand. They 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 wrote about it, and it just it didn't yep. have the the right impact. Well, so that's actually was one of the inspirations for this, this new framework that I'm trying to develop here, which is that again, local news just for the sake of it is not what I'm talking about. Like just the fact that there is a news outlet in my town or city is not in and of itself doesn't say anything. It could be terrible. It could be run by the local businesses and you know, only reporting on what they want to report, right? It it, it is true journalism. And if it is, it should be seen as true journalism and valued. And to your point about George Santos and similar stories all over the world, there needs to be a better way to alert the world to that local journalism when it it should be uh, come above the fold. But even if it doesn't, and it's, it's not always possible to spot what is important until later, but when it does happen later, and then people look back and realize that the local newspaper was reporting it, there should be some value assigned to that local journalism. And maybe that's not monetizable value. Maybe it's, it's, it's accreditation or, or attribution or you know some sort of licensing model or something. But when local news is the origin of a story, when a local journalist is the one that starts it, there has to be a better way of attributing to that and valuing that going up. And I think that's part of what I'm talking about tracking, right? Is that when you are a local journalist you and you own a story, it shouldn't be a good thing for you to turn around six months later and say, oh, I did that story six months ago 
and I'm now happy it's in the New York Times, the New York Times should be, by definition, should be recognizing your work and attributing and linking back to your work. And that value should be captured so mm -hmm. that local news never is never lost. It's never an afterthought, right? So that's a very important part of what I'm trying to do as well. So, David, this has been a fascinating discussion, but we're getting to that point in the podcast where we have to introduce our friend Seamus Plug. Mm -hmm. So clearly you've been pointing towards this new effort. So I'm guessing you're going to plug that, but is there a place where people can go and see or get in touch with you regarding this two-pronged effort you have to make the world of journalism, let's say, a little bit more robust. Um, so where should we look? Yeah. Well, my whenever I go to events or anything else and people say, do you have a card? I always say, if you need a card to find me, then you don't deserve to be connected to me, <laughs> which is very condescending of me and, and a joke, obviously. But, you know, people, I think, know how to find me. I I'm on Twitter at David Clinch News. I'm on email at david at mediagrowthteam.com. That's where I'm concentrating uh, my outreach at the moment. We're sort of still in stealth mode a little bit on this framework that we're building. Um, and anyone who's interested, what I'm interested in is hearing from people who are already involved in this, people who are already thinking about impact um, tracking, people who are already thinking about the value of journalism, people who are already thinking about the future of local journalism. If you're already involved in it and I don't know you, then get in touch with me on Twitter or email and you know let me know. Because one, one of the great things about what I've done in my career and that I'm still interested in doing is a very Irish process of organized laziness. I don't want to build anything that already exists. I don't want to replace anything that already has value. I just want to be able to curate those things, bring them together, and maybe create a new framework where all of those things can be seen. So I'm in that mode at the moment of gathering connections, contacts, uh, existing resources, anything that's out there that I should be aware of in this realm of tracking the value of local journalism in particular, anywhere in the world, um, get in touch and let me know, and I'll show you what I'm building. And so with that, on behalf of our listeners, and uh, me and John, I'd like to thank David Clinch for joining us. This has been a fascinating discussion. I think John and I are in agreement that it's incredibly important for functioning of society to have a robust Forte state. Um, and so we look forward to seeing the impact of your work, David, and hopefully we have the opportunity to bring you back on the podcast again as this effort, uh, you know, gets put together. And so we can kind of see the payoff uh, going forward. So thank you so much for joining us. It's been a real pleasure and look forward to talking again. Thank you, Marjan. Thank you, John. Thanks a million. I will see you again very soon, I'm sure. John, that was a great conversation with David Clinch. And I really got a sense of his passion for the practice of journalism and central importance as he sees it to a functioning democracy. But let me hear your thoughts. Yeah, one phrase he said at the end grabbed me and it seemed to unify a lot of the threads of his life, not an original phrase, value proposition. All throughout talking to David, that idea of the value of, what is the value of, underscoring the value of it, determining just what the value is, both of the content and stories of journalism, the reporting, and also the business model, which without a successful business model, we're not going to have any journalism. So that sense of value proposition mentioned late in the podcast, to me, seemed to inform a lot of what David is doing. Yeah, as I mentioned, what came across also was this real drive, a real sense of the importance of rigor in journalism that is absent in a world where everybody is producing content, but a lot of times people aren't producing real news, real journalism. And David's mission to get people to understand the distinction between drivel and rigor is going to be 
an ever more important conversation going forward as technology, spooky technology, such as yeah, artificial I... intelligence generated news begins to make itself felt. We live, as they say, in interesting times. And in the world of journalism, I can't imagine a more interesting time than right now. Irish Stew is produced by John Lee, Martin Nutty, and Bill Schultz. Editing, mixing, and mastering by Bill Schultz. Music on Irish Stew was composed and performed by Rosa Nutty, with Donald Bowens on drums, Cahill O'Reardon on bass and synthesizer. For more on Rosa Nutty's music, please visit rosanutty.com. Music